Good evening and thank you for joining us for Creme 2 News 10 at 10 where we give you more news in less time. Let's get started. Well, the snow we saw today may be the last of it for a while, but the cold temperatures are sticking around at least for a few days. Let's get straight to Chief Meteorologist Jeremy Lagoo for just how cold we're talking. Jeremy? Oh, that's what everybody wants to know. Still a little bit of snow coming down and still under those winter weather advisories and winter storm warnings through tomorrow morning for the impacts. Want to see the impacts? Let's take a look downtown. Earlier, things were looking pretty good, but that has all changed rather quickly. And with a huge drop in temperatures, snow already piling up and piling up quite good. 23 degrees here in town, and those temperatures have fallen quite a bit. We're down in the 20s or teens everywhere. That is an almost 20 degree drop from where we were this time yesterday, and the snow continues to fall. It likely keeps falling here in Spokane and across much of the inland northwest. And I think it falls into tomorrow morning, so we're waking up to a very snowy commute. But with temperatures cooling, all that snow isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Mid 20s Wednesday, near 20 Thursday, and mid 20s Friday. But look at those overnight lows. 14 tomorrow, 6 Thursday, and 5 Friday morning. When you factor in the wind, it is going to feel like it's below zero, likely from, say, tomorrow morning all the way through Thursday. It is a rather cold forecast. We'll be talking all of this and when we might warm up coming up in just a bit. Sounds good, Jeremy. We'll check back in with you later in the show. Well, tonight, Coeur d'Alene City Council members once again delayed a vote on deciding the future of a large development known as Corterre. Kremtu's Kyle Simchuk was at the meeting and explains what happened tonight. Kyle? Well, people living near the field off Hutter Road where developers want to build thousands of new homes called tonight's outcome a small victory. They're still against this project even after developers made changes tr trying to address some of their concerns. Earlier this month, Coeur d'Alene City Council members gave developers of Corterre two weeks to address some of the concerns brought up during public testimony. Developers agreed to make several changes, like limiting access to the east and building only three homes per acre on the eastern edge, where dozens of people already live, among other things. Coeur d'Alene City Council members still have to approve the plans as well as the annexation of the field. Many thought a decision would happen at tonight's meeting, but Councilman Dan Gukin claims such vote would be against the law. They've completely changed the plan. They've changed the zoning. The zoning that was presented in planning, the zoning that was presented at our hearing two weeks ago. Idaho Code states that if there is a material change, that there must be another hearing. Gukin argued with Coeur d'Alene City Attorney Randy Adams. There has been no change in the evidence. There is a change in the development agreement, but that does not require a new public hearing. In the end, council members agreed to postpone the vote and hold yet another public hearing on Corterre and the new plan put forward by developers. This development will be the largest thing that comes our way for decades. And so I think it's incredibly important that there's integrity in the process. Many neighbors were happy, even calling the latest delay a small victory. They still worry that Corterre will bring too many cars and people to the quiet prairie land. That developer could give us everything that we ask for and still make a bunch of money on this development. Um, so give us something that we can get behind. And the next Corterre hearing is expected to be during the end of March or beginning of April. That's when council members could vote to approve or deny the annexation of the land and the project or perhaps find a way to defer this once again. We'll just have to wait and see, Mark. All right, Kyle, thank you very much. Well, new developments tonight about the WSU student who was found dead in his dorm room back in January. The Whitman County Coroner confirms that Luke Tyler died by suicide. The release also states the combined effects of alcohol and antidepressants found in his system caused his death. We learned today that medication was in fact prescribed to Luke. Following the update from the coroner, Luke's family shared a statement which says he told close friends he was at his breaking point due to hazing at Theta Chi, the fraternity that he belonged to. Luke's family is eager to learn the truth about his experience, they said. The fraternity issued a statement this afternoon offering condolences to his family and saying they expect all members to cooperate with the investigation. Well, veterans experiencing a suicidal crisis can now go to any VA or non-VA healthcare facility for emergency help at absolutely no cost. This includes free inpatient care for up to 30 days and outpatient care for up to 90 days. Officials hope guaranteeing no cost will encourage more people to seek help which could save their life. In the meantime, if you or someone you know is having suicidal thoughts or needs help, 
Call 988 to reach the Suicide Crisis and Lifeline. Again, 988. That number is right there on your screen. Also new tonight, one of two suspects accused of attacking four Washington power substations is asking for a compassionate release from police custody. 40 year old Jeremy Crayon wrote to court officials about issues receiving medical care, saying he is suffering from blood clots and is at high risk for kidney and liver failure. The second suspect charged in the December attacks, 32 year old Matthew Greenwood, was released on bond late last month. And happening tomorrow, Eastern Washington Representative Kathy Morris Rogers will be in Spokane to discuss the new medical education program. Rogers will be at the Spokane Teaching Health Center with the Health Resources and Services Administrator. The medical education program awards hundreds of millions of dollars to 72 teaching health centers across the country. Well, 48 people are behind bars in a human trafficking operation just announced by federal, state and local authorities in California. The youngest victim, just 13 years old. Law enforcement in San Diego has been tracking the operation since January. They've used video surveillance and undercover units to monitor neighborhoods and identify victims, buyers and traffickers. According to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, California has more reported human trafficking cases than any other state in the nation. Alex Murdaugh's only surviving son took the stand and take <clears throat> today in court. Excuse me. He described his father's behavior the night his mother and brother were killed. Buster described his family as tight knit and Murdaugh as a devoted father. But the South Carolina lawyer is accused of killing his wife and son to distract from a decade of alleged financial crimes. Those crimes came to light after Murdaugh's late son Paul crashed a boat, killing a teenage girl. The defense is expected to rest its case by the end of the week. Murdaugh will likely testify before then. And federal environmental regulators are ordering Norfolk Southern to foot the bill following the toxic train derailment and chemical burn more than two weeks ago. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg has been criticized for not visiting the scene of the disaster. He says he'll visit when the time is right. In the meantime, Buttigieg says he wants to increase inspections on high hazard flammable trains. And now to our night beat with a quick look at today's top story. Spokane County is moving forward with a collaborative funding strategy to renovate a Vista Stadium. County commissioners voted to help the Spokane Indians partially fund a $22 million renovation. Those upgrades are necessary to comply with new Major League Baseball standards. This deal reinvests the proceeds from the county's sale of underperforming assets, such as the Raceway Park, into the ballpark along with a multi-million dollar investment by the team itself and the city of Spokane Valley. The team will be responsible for raising $8 million, which the county agrees to match up to another $8 million. Well, tonight, Washington is joining 19 other states in a reproductive freedom alliance. The alliance is a governor commitment to protecting and expanding reproductive freedoms in their states. Governor Jay Inslee released a statement about this new coalition. It reads in part, quote, Washington is taking strong action to protect these freedoms for every patient and provider in our state. And we are all in on the fight to protect a person's right to an abortion across the country, unquote. North Idaho College was recently downgraded in their bond rating, a move that could have drastic impacts on the school's financial future. The downgrade was due to ongoing controversy and unrest with the school's administrative staff. Now the bond the school has is at risk. This means it'll be difficult for the school to build anything new, and that includes student housing. That cost will now be passed on to students who already pay $180 each semester towards the school's debt, all while the school still faces loss of accreditation. And that was your night beat. To learn more about any of these stories, just text us the word night to 509-448-2000 and we'll send them directly to your phone. Well, despite the winter weather today, summer concerts are on their way. Today, a new artist was added to this year's lineup in the Pavilion Summer Concert Series. Just announced today, Seattle-based indie folk band The Head and the Heart. They'll be joined by Father John Misty to play at the Pavilion on August 6th. Tickets for that show go on sale this Friday. Already announced, artists include Lord Huron, and Noah Kahn. In other news, tickets go on sale this week for Bumbershoot, the iconic music and arts festival in Seattle. It's been on hiatus for the past three years because of the COVID pandemic. It is returning Labor Day weekend under new management and just in time for its 50th anniversary. The festival won't just have music, but art, dancing, wrestling, food, to name a few other things. Tickets for that go on sale this Friday.